ultimate law of life and death as transmitted from the Buddha to the people is Myoho Renge Kyo. The five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo were transferred from the two Buddhas inside the treasure tower, Shakyamuni and Taho, to Bodhisattva Jogyo, carrying on a heritage unbroken since the infinite past. Myo represents death and whole life. Life and death are the two phases passed through by the entities of the ten worlds, the entities of all sentient beings which embody the law of cause and effect, Renge. Tientai the Great said, you must realize that the interrelated actions and reactions of sentient beings and their environments all manifest the law of the simultaneity of cause and effect. Sentient beings and their environments here means the reality of life and death. The law of simultaneity of cause and effect is clearly at work in everything that lives and dies. Dengyo the Great said, birth and death are the mysterious workings of essential life. The ultimate reality of life lies in existence and non-existence. No phenomena, heaven or earth, yin or yang, the sun or the moon, the five planets or any life condition from hell to Buddhahood are free from birth and death. Thus, the life and death of all phenomena are simply the two phases of Myoho Renge Kyo. In his Makashikan, Tientai says, the emergence of all things is the ma manifestation of their intrinsic nature and their extinction, the withdrawal of that nature into the state of latency. Shakyamuni and Taho Buddhas, too, are the two phases of life and death. Therefore, to chant Myoho Renge Kyo with the realization that Shakyamuni who attained enlightenment countless aeons ago the Lotus Sutra, which leads all people to Buddhahood, and we ordinary human beings are in no way different or separate from each other, is to inherit the ultimate law of life and death. To carry on this heritage is the most important task for Nichiren's disciples, and that is precisely what it means to embrace the Lotus Sutra. For one who powerfully brings forth his faith and chants Nam Myoho Renge Kyo with the profound insight that this is the last moment of his life, the Sutra proclaims, after his death, a thousand Buddhas will extend their hands to free him from all fear and keep him from falling into the evil paths. How can we possibly hold back our tears at the inexpressible joy of knowing that not just one or two, nor, nor only one or two hundred, but as many as a thousand Buddhas will come to greet us with their open arms? One who does not have faith in the Lotus Sutra will instead find his hands firmly gripped by hellhounds, just as the Sutra warns. After he dies, he will fall into the hell of incessant suffering. How pitiful. The ten kings of hell will then pass judgment on him and the heavenly messengers who have been with him since his birth will censure him for his evil acts. Just imagine that those thousand Buddhas extending their hands to all of Nichiren's disciples who chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo are like sweet melons or fragrant moonflowers extending their slender vines. My disciples have been able to receive and embrace the Lotus Sutra by virtue of the strong ties they have formed with this teaching in their past existences. They are certain to attain Buddhahood in the future. The heritage of the Lotus Sutra flows within the lives of those who never forsake it in any lifetime whatsoever, whether in the past, the present or the future. Those who disbelieve and slander the Lotus Sutra will destroy the seeds for, the bec for becoming a Buddha in this world because they cut themselves off from the potential to attain enlightenment. They do not share the ultimate heritage of faith. All in all, the disciples and believers of, of Nichiren should chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo in perfect unity, Itai Doshin, transcending all differences among themselves to become as indivisible as fish in the water in which they swim. This spiritual bond is the basis for the universal transmission of the ultimate law of life and death. Herein lies the true goal of Nichiren's propagation. When you are so united, even the great hope for Kozen Rufu can be fulfilled without fail. If any of Nichiren's disciples disrupts the unity of Itai Doshin, he will destroy his own castle from within. Nichiren has been trying to awaken all the people of Japan to faith in the Lotus Sutra, so that they too can share the heritage and attain Buddhahood. But instead, they attack me time and again, and finally had me banished to, banished to this island. You have followed Nichiren, however, and met with sufferings as a result. It pains me deeply to think of the anguish you must be going through. Gold can neither be burned by fire nor corroded or swept away by water, but iron is vulnerable to both. A wise person is like gold and a fool like iron. You are like pure gold because you embrace, embrace the gold of the Lotus Sutra. The, the Lotus Sutra reads in part, Sumeru is the highest of all mountains. 
The Lotus Sutra is likewise the highest of all the sutras. It also states, the good fortune of the believer cannot be burned by fire or washed away by water. It must be the karmic relationship we have shared since the distant past that has destined you to become my disciple at a time like this. Shakyamuni and Taho Buddha certainly realized this truth. The sutra statement, in lifetime after lifetime, they were always born together with their masters in the Buddha's lands throughout the universe. Cannot be false in any way. I am extremely proud of you for having asked about the transmission of the ultimate law of life and death. No one has ever asked me such a question before. I have given my answer in complete detail in this letter, so I want you to take it deeply to heart. The important point is to carry out your practice, confident that Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is the very lifeblood which was transferred from Shakyamuni and Taho to Bodhisattva Jogyo. The function of fire is to burn and give light. The function of water is to wash away filth. The wind blows away dust and, bre and, bre and breathe life into plants, animals and man. The earth nourishes the grasses and trees and heavens provide life-giving rain. Myoho Renge Kyo too works in all these ways. It is the cluster of blessings brought by the Bodhisattva of the earth. The Lotus Sutra says that Bodhisattva Jogyo should now appear to propagate this teaching in the latter day of the law. But has this actually happened? Can Bodhisattva Jogyo have already appeared in this world, or has he not? Whatever the case, Nichiren was the first to propagate this teaching. Be thoroughly determined to summon forth the great power of your faith and chant Nam Nyoho Renge Kyo with the prayer that your faith will be firm and correct at the moment of your death. Never seek any other way to inherit and manifest the ultimate law in your life. Only then will you be able to transform desires into enlightenment and the sufferings of life and death into nirvana. It would be useless to embrace the Lotus Sutra without the lifeblood of faith. I am always ready to clear up any further questions you may have. February 11, 1272, Nichin the Sramana of Japan. A reply to Sai Rembo. Good. Well done, Jeff. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, as you remember, during the first lecture, we got just about as far as beginning to understand the title, The Heritage of the Ultimate Law of Life, or Shoji Ichi Daiji Kechi Makusho. So, today, we'll probably get through the first paragraph, if we're fortunate. But whatever happens, I think you'll agree, those of you who came to the first lecture, this is an incredibly, not only profound, but very exciting Gosho. And you remember I mentioned that the sensei said, each time I read it, I am moved anew by the meaning condensed into each sentence and phrase. I can only call it a mystic work. And before him, Mr. Toda said, this is a spotless mirror, referring to this Gosho, a spotless mirror for the practice of the Bodhisattvas of the earth. So really, this Gosho delves deep into the prime point of our faith in this Buddhism, which is the law of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Through this Gosho, you're on your way to understanding the very essence of Buddhism. Through this Gosho, by the time we've finished it, you will really understand, I believe, that second prayer in Gongyo, where the ten virtues of the Gohonzon are expressed. Because this Gosho contains the essence of all that is written in the other great Goshos that Nishin Daishonin wrote. So really, this is a key point in our lives as we study this and learn it together. So just to summarize very quickly, this Gosho, the heritage of the ultimate law of life, covers the ultimate purpose of our practice, which is to attain enlightenment, in other words, achieving our own human revolution, and secondly, to achieve 
a peaceful and prosperous world, in other words, Kosen Rufu. And it contains the whole of Nichiren Daishonin's attitude towards his conviction in the power of Namyo Horenge Kyo to achieve these two things. Therefore, if we understand Nichiren Daishonin's feeling and attitude and apply it to ourselves, this will accelerate our practice very greatly indeed. Especially for us, I think, in the UK at the moment, there are only about 750 of us chanting now. But looking to 5, 10, 15 and 20 years time, everybody of these 750 will find themselves inevitably responsible for a great many other people as the flow of this movement for Kosen Rufu goes on. Therefore again, to understand this Goshen will be like a foundation for all you will find yourselves teaching others in the future. So this is a great moment, I believe, for us. And of course we've been assisted so much because Sensei gave a new lecture. I say new, he lectured on this Gosho about 10 years ago and then he lectured again uh, during last year. And it is on his lecture that all my words are based. My task is to bring his lecture, as it were, into our own environment in the UK and apply it to our stage of development and practice here. So, just to remind you, very briefly, as briefly as I can, of the meaning of the ultimate, uh, sorry, the heritage, heritage of the ultimate law of life, or Shoji Ichidaiji Kechi Nakusho. To understand the meaning, we have to begin to understand those Japanese words, which the expression of characters, each of which have a very deep meaning. So, you remember that Shoji, Shoji, S-H-O-J-I, Shoji, means life. Not just life, as most people think of it, but life which is eternal. Life which has no beginning and no end. Life which is repeating the endless cycle of birth and death. That is the brief meaning of Shoji. So in other words, it reveals, even in that short word, that life has two main states. One we call life, and the other we call death. That life and death are only two conditions of the one state of life. And you remember, we delved into this quite deeply. And we began to understand that death is only a phase of life, an essential phase when we refuel, as it were, ourselves in order to become active in a new phase of life, in a new physical being. So just like sleep is essential in order to refresh ourselves, daily, to go on living a vibrant life. So death is essential in order to revitalize the very entity of our lives and then live again in a new physical shell. So this cycle of life and death, you remember, we discovered was going on not only in us, in our lives or with our life, we know we die, we know we were born, and we are understanding now that we live a life which is eternal. But also, this constant cycle of life and death is going on both within us and outside us, as well as in our own lives. So we know that every cell in our body is going through the cycle of life, of birth to death, every seven years. Every cell in our body, the doctors understand, replaces itself. This is the cycle of birth and death 
going on in small, or small organisms within our own life, within, within our own physical shell. And in the same way, this incredible cycle of birth and death is going on outside us. We know that trees grow and eventually decay, that plants grow and drop seeds and give new life. We know from what the scientists tell us now that stars start with a conglomeration of matter which collects for some reason around some sort of core or entity and that over billions and billions of years the star grows and develops and then finally decays and explodes. And everything disintegrates and fuses back into the universe. So therefore, not only our own lives are going through the cycle of birth and death, but everything that's within our physical being that makes up our hands and fingers and everything else is doing the same thing, and everything outside us is doing the same thing. So we then begin to understand that the whole universe is following a rhythm or a pattern of life and death, and that in fact this pattern of life and what we call death is a pattern in the end of just one word, life, eternal life. So this pattern consists of tiny little organisms supporting larger organisms. Little cells in our body supports us. And we in turn should be supporting the larger organism which is our world. And the world is supporting the larger organism still, which is the galaxy. And so it goes on and on and on. So this is all contained in the word shoji, life. Then ichi, ichi means, I-C-H-I, ichi means one and only, or absolutely the one and only. Everything begins and returns to the point of death or the condition of what we call death. Death's become an ugly word in many people's feelings. But in fact, everything begins from the state of death and comes back to the state of death. So the Buddhist term for that state is ku, K-U. Much easier, isn't it? And rather nicer sounding. Everything starts and ends from that condition called ku. Absolutely the one and only. Everything in this universe is following that pattern. Daiji. Daiji means the fundamental essence or law. There is nothing, in other words, in the universe which is not touched by this law of life and death. It is the fundamental essence of every phenomena and every movement in the universe. So you can see that Ichi Daiji means then the one and only fundamental essence or law. So then, because we have used the word Ku already, meaning the unseen condition of life, which we call commonly death, then we see that Ichi Daiji, the one and only fundamental essence or law, covers what we call the three truths of life. Ku, Ke, Ke, and Chu, C-H-U. Ku, we already understand, is the unseen. Perhaps it could be called the spiritual part of life. Ku is the anger which is latent in your life 
until someone makes you angry and you express it with a red face and glaring eyes. The anger is still in your life, but it can't be seen. This is in the state of cool. When we die and our physical body disintegrates, we're in the state of ku. So ku is the unseen state of life. And K is the seen state, the physical appearance of life. What you see in me, what I see in you, is the condition of K, K-E. And the third of the three truths is Chu, C-H-U. <laughs> Chu is the essence that links the other two. Chu is the rhythm or pattern or law which creates the cycle of ku and ke. All right? So <laughs> Ichi Daiji contains ku, ke, and chu, the very essence of life the truth of life. So, of course, in our own lives, the Gahonzan is Chu. And it's the Gahonzan that links us as a manifestation of K, a living being that everybody can see, with Tu, which is the whole force of life, the whole energy of spiritual life, which exists both within us and outside us. The whole great sea of life, which you can't see, but yet you know it's there because it's always manifesting itself in some way. So in our lives, we in relation to the universe, we are K, the universe is Ku, and Chu is the law that links the two, and that law is embodied in the Gohonzon. So when we chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo to the Gohonzon, the Gohonzon is linking our efforts and harmonizing it with the universe as a whole. We'll come to all that in more detail later. So then, Shoji Ichi Daiji is the one and only fundamental law or essence of life. Or, to put it shorter, the ultimate law of life. You cannot go any deeper. Now, Kechi Myaku. Kechi Myaku. K E C H I M Y A K U. Kechi Myaku is very difficult to translate, but it means the actual rhythm of life, the actual vibration or pulsations of life itself. So you remember, I explained that like the ocean, the sea. On the surface of the sea, you have many changing conditions. One day it may be calm, one day it may have little ripples, another day it may have white horses, and another day enormous waves. But right down deep in the ocean, in the silence that lies there, there is always a current flowing. So of course, the waves on the top and are totally linked with all that lies underneath. They're all part of the same sea. They have the same constituents. So what we see in life, the manifestation of life, is like those waves and ripples always changing on the surface. But deep below it, there is this constantly flowing current, moving silently, 
steadily and incredibly strongly. This is Kechimyaku, the pulsation of life or the rhythm of life or the current of life. So Kechimyaku could best be translated really as the eternal current of life which is constantly flowing and manifesting itself in a myriad different phenomena from elephants and rhinoceroses, hurricanes, stars, the sun, you and I, everything. Now, Kechimyako also means the master-disciple relationship. In other words, the current or the flow of Buddhism is carried through the vibrating, dynamic relationship of master and disciple. Without the master, the disciple cannot learn. So it is the master-disciple relationship that carries on the understanding of Shoji Ichi Daiji, the fundamental essence or law of life. So the current of Buddhism is expressed in that relationship. And I want to just talk about that relationship for a little while. Just recently, we've had a very perfect example, or put it another way, we're in the process of understanding a very perfect example of the function of the master and disciple relationship. It's the master's task to interpret the rhythm of the law so that the disciple can not only understand it, but use that understanding to make great progress in his own life. This is the function of the master. He helps the disciple to understand the rhythm or the law of life working at this very moment. And through this understanding, the disciple can seize it and use it to make his own life advance. So in other words, the master is interpreting for the assistance of the disciple's development the rhythm of life, which is also the rhythm of the human revolution in each one of us. And it is also the rhythm of Kos and Rufu, the movement for peace, because the movement for peace is nothing else but a joining together of thousands of human revolutions in thousands of different lives. So let's look at that just a little more closely. At the annual general meeting on the 15th of October, <coughs> Sensei sent us a special message to us in the UK. And there were two main points in that message, which was quite short. The first one was that at this particular time it is especially important for us to follow the three practices of Gongyo and Daimaku, of activities to teach others and study as diligently as we can. And he ended that message by saying that we must remember and understand that in Buddhism there is no deadlock. In other words, provided you continue the three practices steadily 
and don't get thrown out of gear by obstacles and difficulties that may arise in your life, there can be no deadlock. You will always break through and win. And then he sent a New Year message to everyone throughout the world. And this message said, very briefly, firstly, that he'd made this coming year another year of study so that we could continue to polish our lives and achieve what he termed splendid new growth. And through this study, he asked us to work towards achieving what he called doubt-free faith, conviction in the power of the Gonsan through actual proof in our own lives. <coughs> and he ended by saying, even if it were possible to miss the earth while pointing straight at it, if someone were able to bind the skies together, if the tides were to cease to ebb and flow, or if the sun were to rise in the west, it could never happen that the prayers of devotees of the Lotus Sutra would go unanswered. A quotation from Nichiren Daishonin's Gosha. And then he talked about unity. He said, please respect each other from the bottom of your hearts. Grow together and protect each other, giving the sincerest concern to each and every individual. So he had talked about the three practices, about study, about the need to, to look after each other and respect each other's lives, and to carry out the three practices diligently. Now we know that this was preparation. In Buddhism, the great masters have always followed the sequence, as I said last time, of preparation, revelation, and transmission. This is the sequence of all the Buddha's teachings back to as far as time can record. And we understand now that those two messages for preparation. <coughs> Shortly afterwards, we had the revelation. And the revelation, you all know, was to point out to us that in the rhythm of life, 1978, and especially the first half of that year, would be incredibly important because it was a turning point. In the rhythm of life, it was a turning point. And turning points, as we know from the Gosho, are significant and important, both to our own lives and to the movement for Kosen Rufu. Nichiren Daishonin explains this in many Gosho. And you remember I said a month ago that it's like a farmer growing his crops. There is a point of time when if that farmer is wise, he can apply fertilizer and he will get a double crop. If he misses that perfect timing, he will not. And Nijin Daishonin explains a turning point in a similar way. It is a chance for us to accelerate our progress towards enlightenment. And of course, it is usually marked by some significant event, which in this case, in 1979, is the 700th anniversary of the inscription of the Daigahonsi. So Sensei then said, if you will really practice hard, especially in the first six months of 1978, you will achieve as much as 10 or 100 years of human revolution compared with other times. You will achieve 10 or 100 years of work removing unhappy karma from your life in the first few months of 1978. 
This is the master interpreting the rhythm of life for the disciples' use. So he prepared the way and then he made the revelation and then of course comes transmission. On the 26th of January, which was the anniversary of the First World Peace Conference, Mr. Izumi, who is responsible to Sensei for overseas areas, sent us another message. And the main points of this message were, first of all, that we should really live the spirit of Honin-myo. This Buddhism is the Buddhism of Honin-myo, the Buddhism of the true cause. The cause you make now determines your future. Not what happened to you in the past, because although what happened to you in the past has formed your unhappy karma, by making great causes from now, this minute, you can change that calm. This is the spirit of Honinda. He repeated that there is no deadlock in Buddhism and asked us again to be diligent in our three practices, to throw ourselves into successful discussion meetings and then he talked about Shakabuku teaching others about Buddhism. And he said this, it is my greatest wish that through this struggle in the depths of your lives, the struggle of the human revolution, especially in these few months, to rid ourselves of unhappy karma, you will bring, you will bring yourself to talk to your friends who are suffering in one way or another, turning the courage arising from your practice into jihi or Buddhist mercy. The basic principle of our movement is that each of us should devote ourselves wholeheartedly to each and every friend as if nothing else matters except his or her happiness. Please engrave this principle in your lives and advance together with joy and friendship. So in this case, Sensei prepared the way, Sensei made the revelation or the interpretation of this particular moment of time and then he left it to Mr. Izumi to talk about the transmission, teaching others. So I've emphasized this and taken a bit of time over it because I wish to try to make clear the relationship of master and disciple in Buddhism. Through his experience, the master interprets. The disciple digests it, challenges it, proves it in his actual life, and therefore advances further towards enlightenment himself. Without the master-disciple relationship, as the high priest said some time ago, there can be no Buddhism. Buddhism can never flow without it. So please open your eyes and ears to this fact, because I know that it is a struggle for us in the West to understand the master-disciple relationship. But it's the very fundamental or base of the flow of Buddhism and has been over thousands of years. So the more we understand and prove in our lives the wisdom and mercy and incredible caring of sensei, the more we will desire through our daimoku and through putting to the test all of his guidance to get closer and closer to him. Because this is the whole purpose, that through this we should inherit 
the ultimate law of life, and in due course pass that heritage on to those who follow us. This is the current or the flow of Buddhism. So at the same time as Sensei was giving this guidance to us over a period of a few months, we in our turn, of course, in the UK, were chanting nam myoho renge And because of that, we felt, all of us, that we should put on a great show in February. And we felt, all of us, that we should start a shakabuku campaign in the same month to run through until May. This is the rhythm of Myoho working in our lives, which puts us in absolute harmony with the rhythm of Myoho, not only working in the master's life, but also working in the lives of our fellow members in every country of the world. So what is the purpose of the show? What is the purpose of the Shakabuki campaign? Nothing else in the end, but so that we can do, each of us, our human revolution. Of course, there are a myriad benefits going outwards. There are other people who will find nam myoho renge through it. This is the Buddhism of practice for yourself and practice for others. <coughs> but in the end, of course, the purpose of it all is that we should do our human revolution. So this is such a marvelous example of the rhythm of Myoho and the master-disciple relationship working at this very moment of time. So then I want to say a word here about Shakabuku. This whole Gosho is about transmitting the heritage of the ultimate law of life. The heritage that we receive and transmit to others so that they can change their unhappy karma. So thinking about Shakabuku, I feel there are really three phases of it. And each is of vital importance. The first phase is what I would call sowing seeds. The phase where you make friends and you tell this friend or those friends about Buddhism. The introduction, in other words. Now, some of those seeds sprout immediately. So fast it takes your breath away. But others of them may take a long, long time. Some people may take a year before they commit themselves, like I did. Other people may take ten years. But the sowing of the seed is very important. Because they have the Buddha state, each person, that part of their lives is alerted or activated when they hear about nam myoho renge -kyo. And therefore, for some strange reason, which we know really isn't strange, they never forget nam myoho renge -kyo. Perhaps in six or eight years' time, something goes a bit wrong in their lives. And something makes them think of nam myoho renge -kyo. Though they haven't thought of it for six years. We know so many cases, don't we, like that. So that is the first phase, the sowing of the seed. And you can only sow the seed through friendship. <laughs> through sincere, warm friendship. And the second phase, I would term the gaining of trust.